We call them the Amish. Shunning modern advancements, they drive horses and buggies and live without electricity. Where do they come from? Are they a culture? A religion? What made them who they are? This film series explores the inner workings of the Amish church, as told by some of their own, who no longer wear black hats and bonnets. For 300 years, the Amish have been known as the silent in the land, but now a growing number of them are breaking the silence. My name's Joseph Graver. I'm your host for this film series. I grew up Old Order Amish. Since my family left the Amish, I've gotten lots of questions. What's it like growing up Amish? What exactly do the Amish believe? And why do they do what they do? From the outside, the Amish look very similar. But since marrying somebody who grew up Amish and working on this film project, I've learned that they can be quite different from community to community. And those differences are very important to them. There is a difference in all the Amish. They're not the same. There are around 300,000 Amish in America, and each of their stories are different. They have similarities, like horses and buggies, but each of their stories is unique. If you're like me, you have a lot of questions about the Amish, and in this episode, we're going to answer some of those questions. So let me introduce you to some of the people that we met on this journey. I'm Aura G. Ash, and born Amish. I am Irene Ash, and I was born to an Amish couple. Yeah, my name is Sam Burkholder, and I was born at Medford, Wisconsin. My name is Barbara. Lloyd Miller is my name. I am Marietta, and I grew up in Middlebury, Indiana. I was a third in a family of, of eight, plus we have uh, two brothers in the grave. So there was 10 children my mother had. There were 15 in my family. I had a mom and dad that really cared for me. Uh, they gave us a roof and a bed and food and transportation and really cared for us. Mm -hmm. I had dozens and dozens of cousins. And you know, grandparents, always part of the family and uncles and aunts. You've seen them as you've driven by on the road, out there working with their animals. But are all Amish farmers? We had about 160 acres, 40 was wood, so we had 120 acres to farm. So we were constantly plowing or doing something on the fields, putting in long, long days. I plowed by the, by the time I was six years old, and I was milking cows, and I was hauling manure with the horses. And I remember starting to do field work with team horses at age seven. And there was many a day when either I or dad would work till dark and the other one would go to the barn and milk the cows. Sometimes mom was sick, couldn't help. I, you know, there was many a night when I milked all 16 of those cows by myself. Not all Amish are farmers. Even historically, some of them have been blacksmiths and weavers and builders. But most of the Amish have gardens and animals, and so we think of them as farmers. The rural culture it brings that with it, you know. But the Amish is exclusively suited for a rural culture. Any other culture would not work. You know, Amish wouldn't stay Amish in the town. They just couldn't do it. It doesn't work there. It has to be rural. It almost has to be Midwestern or, you know, Northern. Um, it's very hard to make it work in a state like Texas where it's real hot in the summertime. Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania. That area of the country uh, is very conducive to the Amish culture as we know it. Since being married, I've had a chance to ride in a few Amish buggies, and they were all different. There were ones that were open, ones that were closed, different shapes. When you see a picture of a horse and buggy, you can tell almost where they're coming from because every community has its unique little things. Dozens of communities in Missouri and Iowa and Wisconsin, Minnesota, and for a large part, they're, they're kind of similar. It's what I call the Midwestern Amish. But if they're from Indiana, they have a unique uh, style. From North Indiana, has a unique style to its buggies. You can just tell it when you see it. Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, has a unique style. 
But there are some of these communities that would have brown buggies instead of black buggies like we're used to. Some of those had yellow buggies. You can see so much by how a buggy is shaped. You know, some of those were just, what we call them big cracker box buggies, you know, just big square boxes. Our buggy that we had in the Midwest uh, just had curtains on the side and on the back straight down. Uh, Indiana style, you know, has a, a trunk in the back where you could lift up a lid and put things in. The same thing with a woman's head covering. Uh, every community is unique, you know. Again, the Midwestern were kind of similar, but Indiana had a specific style. Ohio had a style. Pennsylvania had, a, had the most unique style of all. What are some of your favorite childhood memories? What's it like growing up as a little Amish girl? The whole world thinks it's the cutest thing in the world, a little Amish girl. <laughs> yeah, you're What's right. it like? <laughs> well, I guess I didn't know it was, I was that cute, you know, but. <laughs> it's a little but, bonnet. <laughs> yeah. We played doll a lot. We'd go out to the barn and just have a little space where we'd call this our house. So, what kind of dolls did you play with? We had some homemade rag dolls, but we also did have some with real faces. and. But of course, our parents kind of discouraged some uh, to have some that had hair. And we made the clothes for them, Amish clothes, of course, and we just had a lot of fun with that. So why didn't they have hair? Well, because, probably because we couldn't braid them like the Amish, it wouldn't have the Amish look if it had hair. My mom, I remember her saying to my sisters, that doesn't even look Amish, the hair, were too short or they were curled or they were dyed or and they would talk about the dyed hair mm -hmm. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> enjoy gardening playing playing out in the woods sometimes sundays rainy days were some of my most favorite times too because growing up on a farm when it rained it brought everybody together my brothers and my dad, they would bring harnesses and stuff they were working on into the living room in the house. Nobody complained about it. Everybody was together. Everybody was doing something. And then singing. Singing is something we all loved. My dad loved to do is sing. He would copy out songs and put them behind the kitchen sink. And he would say, girls, I want to hear you singing. And you know what? As long as we were singing, we weren't fussing. And I think he knew that. <laughs> so that's one reason why he wanted us to sing riding in a buggy with my parents, and they always sang together in harmony all the way to wherever we were going and all the way home when we came back. The Amish to the outsider appear very similar in the way they dress, but to them, those details on their clothing are very important. So why do they wear the plain clothes? Because Jacob Amon was a tailor, clothing became a huge emphasis for the Amish. Today, it's just part of their identity. So, do I miss wearing the Amish clothing? Not really, but the transition was sometimes hard. Check out this story. Growing up Amish, my mom had always made all my clothes for me, my shirts, my pants, everything. I remember after we left the Amish, one of the first times I went into a thrift store, I was looking for pants. And I stood there and I looked down those long rows of pants and I was trying to figure out what size I might be. And then I looked up and I saw that some of the pants said men and some of them said women. It had never occurred to me that girls could wear pants too. And I had no idea how to tell the difference between girl pants and boy pants. I was so shaken that I just left and got out of the store. I really didn't want to accidentally buy some girl pants and show up somewhere wearing girl pants. <laughs> when you leave the house, you will be wearing a hat. You would wear your hat until you walked inside the house, then you would take it off. But if you got up to go and leave or whatever, you go outside, you know, even if it's just about outside for a minute, you go get your hat, you know, you'd find your hat in that big pile of black hats over there and just step outside, you know. You weren't seen with that. Those Amish men have big, long beards, but why do they shave their mustaches? It's for the same reason that many Amish communities don't allow Amish men to wear buttons on their coats. Centuries ago, when the Amish were first putting together their ordinance letters, 
There was a lot of military action going on, and the Amish didn't want to have any part of it. In France, the military men often wore mustaches and had buttons on their coats. Later, when the Amish came to America, the military here was the same. In an effort to show that they would not take any part in the military, the Amish chose not to wear mustaches or buttons on their coats. Today, it's tradition. Medin was Medin because Celis de Vegas the Dores could do it. We do what we do because that's the way Grandpa did it. What language do the Amish speak? For the first seven years of my life, I spoke Pennsylvania Dutch, a dialect of German the Amish use. And then, the summer I was seven, I began learning English in preparation for school. In third grade, my mother began teaching me High German, so that I would be able to read the songs and scriptures at church. Had my family stayed Amish, this is a conversation I might have had with myself. Yeah. And the Jacob Bowman, the men of Simons, and Sahaj Stead, as my head no called, was it that he the Schrift lese and he had a gemeen verlasse, and the lad um sie rum and saw him the glove verlasse. And me saw as him the glove of Stead. Now, what's the question? So, as it's that he the Schrift lese. What's the meaning special? What's when the Bible different sagt as what the old Zeit had? Many Amish people have found themselves asking similar questions and getting those kinds of answers. Much of what the Amish practice has been handed down from generation to generation until many of the Amish don't even know why they do the things they do. What are some things you see about the Amish lifestyle and culture that are positive that you, when you see them? They trust their children. Mm -hmm. They get to have responsibilities in little chores around the house and even when they're very small. Parents normally teach their children work ethics, accountability, responsibility at a young age. They trust their children. It's like in their culture, to let them go out and play with their cousins and not be looking over their shoulder all the time. Where is he, where is he, what, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. Once in a while, a mom would come out and, and check up on us, but we were by ourselves yeah, playing not hard for the most part. All. Sharing as family, a lot of families are larger, so you share. And we always cherish getting together, and that's a practice that the Amish do a lot. Mm -hmm. If you want to go visit someone, which is, the thing you do, because there's no TV, there's no, you don't want to go to a ball game, you don't go to the fair. If you're going to go someplace, you go visit somebody. Mm -hmm. And so we go to our cousins. And and man, the word from mom and dad saying, we're going to go to our cousins tonight, is like, whoopee, you know? <laughs> and we just were all, all ears, all excited. Everybody was doing what they could to make this happen. We don't even know if they're going to be home, but we're going to chance it. And it takes 45 minutes to get there. They're only five miles away. As you get closer, you just say, are they home? Are they home? Mm -hmm. and, and sure enough, they're home, you know? And then the excitement just rolls. Mm -hmm. But if they're not, you start saying, oh, where else can we go now? Because we're not gonna turn around and go back 45 minutes. We had a misfortune in our family. Our barn burned down from a lightning strike. How the community just came right away and helped us helped us build a new barn and brought in meals and food. The women of the community, they, they cut out and sewed new dresses for me during, during that time. Just the way the Amish have, have a heart to help and a heart to be there in, in catastrophe or in times of need. 
And that's what the Amish have taught us. And I really, really honor them for that. Always will. Are the Amish involved in politics at all? And do they vote? It seems that every election cycle, some candidate is going after the Amish vote. And while some Amish in some communities do vote, where I was growing up, it was considered worldly and undue involvement with the civil government. Although I do remember finding out that one of my friend's dad was actually voting secretly. It was somewhat scandalous. The Amish have their own one-room schoolhouses, but is it true that they only go to the eighth grade? An eighth grade education is deemed sufficient for Amish children to be prepared for the Amish lifestyle. However, when my mom was a little girl, they were still sometimes attending the public schools. But in the 1960s, my great-grandfather and some other Amish men took on the government and went to court in order to gain freedom from the Amish to educate their own children in their own one-room schoolhouses and to only go to the eighth grade. It's well known in America that the Amish do not use electricity. Why not? We didn't have electricity. I heard a lot of things over the years. I don't know which one is true, but we didn't have electricity because it was worldly. Well, some people said the electricity itself isn't worldly, but being having wires attached to our house that come from the outside, that's a connection with the world we don't want. One of the fun things about visiting Joseph's family is getting to eat some of their traditional Amish meals. But do the Amish eat more healthy than the rest of America? Amish have rules about everything except food. Food is the one area they can freely indulge. Sure, they grow a lot of things in their gardens, but most Amish aren't opposed to chemical fertilizers. And Amish people buy many things at the same grocery stores other people do. The biggest shock for many people is how much food the Amish eat and how many sugars and carbs and fats are in those foods. We have an Amish recipe for an apple dessert. If you put in a third of the sugar that it calls for, it is still quite sweet. Now, of course, eating habits vary from family to family, and even if their diet is excessive, their active lifestyle seems to allow them to do this. The Amish are known for home remedies, so do they use normal doctors? When I was six years old, my family moved from Middlebury, Indiana to Clark, Missouri. Three years after we got there, my mother died from cancer. She tried all kinds of medical treatments, and she went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, and had radiation treatments, she had surgery. And another interesting thing, there was an old Indian doctor who used to come out, and he'd bring some bitter black medicine, and uh, she took that, but it didn't, you know, it obviously didn't help either. Both of my grandmothers died when my parents were around 10 years old. Diabetes, cancer, heart disease, pneumonia, these were all common among the Amish. As a child, I was taken to chiropractors, dentists, and even doctors. And while my family didn't vaccinate, some Amish families do. And I did get the whooping cough and chicken pox, as well as the occasional flu and cold. Another thing that had really started to bother me was the transportation issue. You had to go get a taxi driver if you wanted to go somewhere um, yeah, that was any, any distance that was too far for your horse. We'd have to hire a driver, you know, we'd pay a taxi, and sometimes it's real hard to get one, and you couldn't always go one of you, but you would have to hire this, you know, and I can't um, take my wife to the doctor, but I can let my neighbor, him, I let him take my wife to the doctor because he drives a car and I can't. I just started feeling so frustrated that my family needs things. I can't do it, you know, I can't meet the need. I could just as well be providing this for my family, but I can't because we believe in a religious belief that says we can't do it this way, but we have to let some other person, you know. I just remember how much we appreciated when we got our own vehicle, mm -hmm. how we could just go whenever we wanted to, and, and we could go together as a family. That was so nice. I thought Amish people weren't supposed to have phones, so how would they call a driver to come pick them up? Most Amish communities do not allow them to have phones in their homes. Some of them allow them in 
their shops or businesses, and a few have even started allowing cell phones under certain circumstances. But a common sight in many Amish communities is still the Amish phone booth, conveniently located within walking distance. Access to simple things that aid in cleanliness, like showers and running water, are not available and often not allowed in many Old Order Amish homes. Most of my childhood years, we lived in communities that used outhouses and we took a bath once a week. Running water and bathtubs are much more common now, but daily baths still seem excessive for most of the Old Order Amish. I had heard that as a young Amish person grows up, they're allowed to go out into the world to try driving cars and experiencing life outside of their Amish community, just to see if they really want to come back and join the Amish, and that this is called Rumspringa. But do the Amish really embrace this? And what is it? Rumspringa literally means running around. And yes, many Amish young people do sow their wild oats. However, the media has often wrongly claimed that Amish young people on purpose are sent out into the world to sin before deciding whether or not they want to be Amish. I was wild. I had a tape player in my buggy. Uh. <laughs> I had rings on my horses. I had a flashy buggy. I built, I built my own. Mm -hmm. And and I, I was dating Irene. She knew the thought of having a car was kind of there in my mind. Hey, this would be fun to experience at least. Then I found out through her, she didn't directly tell me this, but it's like, if you get a car, uh, you're gonna have to choose between me and the car because my dad will never ever let me go out with a car, with a guy with a car. Where I grew up, if any of the boys got cars, they were considered the naughty boys. And far from being all right with it and saying, ah, oh, it's just Rumspringa, their parents would weep for their children. Because according to church teaching, if a child rebelled against the rules of the church and went into the Rumspringa time, they were in danger of hell fire. Some people see the Amish as very devoted Christians, but how much do the Amish read the Bible? To an Amish person, the Bible is in German. There is no other Bible. By the time I was 10 years old, I was learning three languages. I was doing all right with the first two, but the third one, High German, was a real struggle for me because it wasn't a spoken language. We just read it in church. But still, I was fortunate because both of my parents could read and understand German. Many Amish parents do not know German well enough to teach their children at all. Being Amish, your Bibles had to be German. Not knowing the grammar makes a world of difference. The only time that you were free to talk about God is on a Sunday morning church service, when it was okay to open the Bible and, and to preach and to talk about God or to give testimony. As soon as the service was over, it went back to its default setting, and you never really were able to talk about it. It became uncomfortable to talk scripture and and uh, just openly talk about Jesus. But when you went to church on Sunday morning, you never carried a Bible to church. That would have been so wrong. Even if you were a preacher, you did not carry a Bible to church. There was a Bible provided for, at the church. That was the church's Bible that you would use to read the scripture. It is sometimes the case that when an Amish person starts reading the Bible a lot, they are warned to be careful because reading the Bible often causes Amish people to leave the church. If you find that shocking, here is another little known fact about the Amish. Some of them are involved in a form of witchcraft. When I was five or six years old, I remember being outside of Grandpa's house and they were working in the garden. All at once, they, they were all excited talking about something. They had this mole and they found one alive. They had hoed it up while they were working in the garden. And they were all excited. Oh, we have to get somebody to hold this mole till it dies. They were saying, well, who is the oldest one here that isn't seven years old yet? And so they decided I was the lucky one. And uh, they came over there and they explained to me, said, if you hold this mole, then till it dies, then you will be able to put your hands on people and you can heal people. You can bra. Among the Amish, there are bra doctor, people who try to bring healing by using spells and word formulas and mystical actions. As a boy, I remember my grandmother using this as an alternative to prayer. 
I said, I do not want to touch that dirty thing. Ew. But they said, yes, yes, this is really special. We'll, one of them said, I'll sit right beside you and I'll, I'll hold your hand while you hold it. And you just hold it and it'll be so special because you probably won't get another chance because you'll soon be seven and then you'll be too old and it won't work. So I said, okay. So I sat there and held that filthy thing till it finally died. And so they were telling everybody that if any of the babies has a tummy ache, I should just hold it. And seriously, the babies quieted down. I held them. I got a tummy ache and the baby slept. But then I started getting these horrible nightmares. I mean, things that now they make horror movies of them. Back then, I didn't know where in the world these thoughts came from. I would just wake up in a cold sweat, just be shaking. And I would try to tell my mom. I remember a special one morning, I had a, had a bad, horrible dream again. And I, I was just so sick of it. And I, was, and I was buttoning up my dress and I came out. My mom was standing at the stove making breakfast. I just wanted to tell her so she could assure me that that's just a dream. It couldn't ever happen. But she, I just remember she must have had a dozen things to do because, and she just said, oh, Becky, just go play. Don't think thoughts like that. Just go play. I said, okay. So I went and I never could tell anybody what I was dreaming. From the outside, she looked like a normal, cute little Amish girl. Her otherwise happy childhood was being marred by these horrible nightmares. As she grew older, her father, unaware of what was happening to his daughter Becky, inadvertently helped her when he taught her how to read German. He got this little green book and he showed me some prayers in the back. He said, here are some nice little prayers. If you want to memorize them, then you can just say them whenever you need to say a prayer. So I thought, this is good. And one of them was about an asking the angels to stand beside my bed while I slept. I memorized three of those little prayers and he had also gotten us to memorize the Lord's Prayer. So every night, the night before I went to sleep, I would say the Lord's Prayer, then I would say these other prayers, especially the one prayer that said, and little angel come and stand by my bed and watch me while I sleep so nothing bad can happen. And I did not have the nightmares. I was so happy and I knew prayer worked. Now I had something to fight back. The last time I actually saw my mother alive, although she wasn't really conscious that she knew we were there, was when they took us to the hospital and my dad told us three of his girls went on one side of the bed, three on the other side. He told us to hold her hand there because she, would, she kept rolling her head back and forth and saying, girls, where are my girls? She would say, mate, what's in the mate? What's in the mate? You know, where are the girls? And my dad would say, they're right here, they're here with you. And she would just keep mumbling and, and going on and she was delirious. She didn't realize we were even there. I had read enough of the Bible that I knew he healed people in the Bible and I thought surely he would hear my prayers and heal my mother. I prayed every day, all day long. I was just, Lord, heal my mother. Make her be all well, make it be okay. I would just plead and pray and pray and pray. and. Nine days later, she was dead. I'm not even gonna pray anymore. God doesn't even hear my prayers. So I quit and the nightmares came back. I started having nightmares. So I said, okay, I guess they're good for one thing. Trapped by grief on one side and recurring nightmares on the other, she kept praying and looking for answers. I read this book called The Prince of the House of David, a novel about a young girl in the time of Jesus and the crucifixion in Jerusalem. And it just made it so real that I saw what Jesus actually did for us. And I became very convicted of my sin and I repented and I made recompense for everything I could. It was for real. I could see that this Jesus really died for me. So then I read my Bible and it said that if you believe and are baptized, and the way the Amish preachers always preached it, they said, if you're old enough to know that you should be baptized and you don't get baptized, if you die before then, you'll go to hell. So I asked my dad if I could go get baptized. He said, no, we don't, they don't baptize 15 year olds. And I said, well, what am I gonna do? He said, well, you just have to wait till you're old enough. So I lived in terror for a couple of years. I was afraid I was gonna die and I would have to go to hell because they wouldn't baptize me. But I survived. Till I was 17 that summer. And when I got baptized, I thought, now I am baptized. I know I can go to heaven. But then the devil came at me with thoughts like, 
Okay, now you're you're a baptized believer. Now, if persecution comes to the countries, when the communists come over here and take over the country, you're going to have to suffer for your faith. They'll probably chop your head off or something, and you're going to be tortured. They'll torture you because you're a baptized believer. As long as I was with other people, I could handle my fear. But when I got married and Lester would leave, I, I had to keep really busy working or reading or it would just get the best of me. And for a while there, whenever Lester had a job where a guy would come pick him up and go make wood or hay or whatever, and as soon as he drove out the lane, I hit the bed and the covers were over my head and I was in the bed all day until I heard him drive home at night. And then I would jump out and go out in the kitchen and start pretending as if nothing happened and just then get as much done as I could in the evenings till he left again. And it was crazy, but I was so scared. But then when we lived there, after Ruth was born, we started going to the library and getting books to read. And then we also, we'd always, if there were yard sales or secondhand bookstores, we always checked them out. And I got a hold of some of Kathleen Marshall's books and I started reading them. And she came through a lot of struggles herself. And uh, I just really loved them and they started helping me. And I started doing what she said. And one thing I remember especially that was probably the most liberating of all that I ever did was she wrote how she made a list of everybody that ever hurt her that she had to forgive. And so I, I wrote down, I went way back, anything I could ever remember that she said, you know, if you think of the person and you think, ooh, then, then there's something there. And you figure out what it is and you write it down and then you pray about it. And you, for, you say out loud that you forgive that person and you ask God to bless them. And then you, then you throw that list away. And that did such a thing to me. It was so relieving. It helped me so much. Forgiveness brought a lot of freedom to my mother, but there were still areas where doubt and fear could hide. Years later, as we were leaving the Amish, we learned about spiritual warfare. I knew that I had to get this thing out of me that was put in there when I held that mold till it died. Once and for all, mom was able to pray and renounce the dark powers and find a complete victory. And I was so free and so happy. Do you think you be schmerl as the dad and the daughter and the grass daughter? The Bible is elder starting to believe. Even you should was die Bibel so ist so uh, let's es ist ein Quar da drin es ist ein Quar If it's dangerous for an Amish person to read the Bible then what happens if they read it We left Denver Sunday afternoon or evening so we got here in Trigo Montana around one or two o'clock on Tuesday, we went to RJ's house, Cripple Creek Ranch. So you're saying even though there wasn't an Amish minister here, you were still having church, still having the Bible Bible readings? Or, mm. Yeah, so we, we, we took our brains together you know, and said, okay, how are we going to do this now? Well, we're, you're going to come to my house. It's our turn. And next two weeks from now, it's your turn. And the guy that's turn it was to have the house was to read the scripture that was set forth for that that period. Okay. So that was the first time for me mm -hmm. to get up in front of people and actually read the Bible in German because I practiced like crazy to make this <laughs> so, I could, yeah. so I could actually read it. Mm -hmm. How did that impact you then with the... Well, the, the, the huge impact was that, okay, I couldn't understand it in what I was reading in German. I could kind of read German, mm -hmm. but I knew half the meaning of the words. Okay. And so I, we got this German-English Bible side by side. Okay. That yes. we would still be obedient to reading the German, but we had the English to compare it with. Okay? <laughs> yes, yes. And so that just opened the, the, the meaning mm -hmm. of the word. Yeah, it had an English Bible that I am now have in my possession. But uh, we didn't read it, you know, it was English. And English was worldly. And church, we spoke Pennsylvania Dutch. We preached Pennsylvania Dutch. In fact, we got chided sometimes for using too many English words in our sermons. And we prided ourselves in trying to get all the words right. 
The only mindset that we have when we grew up and most Amish have is you either stay exactly who you are or you become completely something else. You leave and discard and reject everything. And I didn't want to reject everything. And yet the time came when I realized that we're going to need to do something other than what we're doing. Because I wanted to know this God that saved me in a new way, and I wanted to know how to pray. As I began studying the Word of God for myself, I soon found out that um, they're not being, the leaders are not being as, as open as I thought as far as uh, really living, living out what the Bible teaches. There would be German words we'd say, oh, I think this was what this means according to what the preachers always said. Yeah. And we'd read it, read it in English and you'd say, ah, oh, it really don't really mean that anymore. Oh, wow, okay. You couldn't read from the Bible. You preached from total memory. And a lot of what we preached turned out to be something we heard others say, we quote others, and we thought it was the Bible. And we found out later that a lot of the things that we thought were Bible really weren't. They were just things that we'd all quoted each other over year, years and years and years. Just being a part of the church mm -hmm. made a huge impact, I believe, in our spirit. Mm -hmm. More than just dressing yourself right and coming and sitting and showing yourself, you're expected to be a part of it. And actually reading it, understanding it, saying something. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like Buried if witness. you know something and you say it, it just, fills you more. I mean, yes. it gives you a deeper insight. Yeah. One Amish preacher gave me a, an English translation, one of the newer ones that were easy to understand. He said, if you read this, you will understand things you never knew existed in the Bible. So I got reading more in the Bible, and uh, I got to do research on the Amish history, how that got started. And I was amazed at some of the findings. I realized hey, this is on shaky ground. A lot of the things we were taught are not scriptural. Even though the Amish religiously pray with their own families out of little prayer books, they are discouraged from meeting with other Amish families for prayer meetings. Why is this? We were introduced to prayer meetings uh, on how to pray and, and verbally pray, which we weren't used to that at all. And that became part of our life. It was like, man, this is life. This is what we need. And we so enjoyed being around people that did that. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing that. And then, of course, the, the opposite side came and said, no, 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 no. You can't do that with those people. In fact, you shouldn't even be praying verbally because that is proud. When we prayed in an official capacity, we would uh, use the little Amish prayer book you know, even if you prayed at home with your family, you wouldn't just pray from your heart. You would open the little prayer book and you'd read the prayer. We started uh, reading the Bible more and just seeing some things that didn't seem to quite make sense, uh, living in the Amish lifestyle. So we read more and eventually they excommunicated us and then we started going to a non-denominational church in Eureka. So if you have Amish neighbors, is it okay to talk to them about the Bible? I mean, how should you interact with them? And if you find out that one of them is leaving the Amish church, is it okay to help them? Should we help them? If you're a non-Amish family and someone comes to you and wants help because they just left the Amish, be very careful that you don't start to tell them what to do because they've just come out of that um, controlled atmosphere. And the best thing to do is to step back and let them find their own way. If they are born again and a child of God, we have to let the Holy Spirit guide them in all truth and be there for them when they need us, stay out of their way when they don't need us. What I see in many of the Amish that are leaving, they come out and all of a sudden a world opens up. We have so many choices, uh, church denominations, which one is right. A lot of them become very judgmental of everybody else. 
Uh, to them, it's black and white. If you don't see it the way I do it, that means that you and I can't fellowship. And at that time, I didn't have enough revelation to know that there was, that that was possible yeah. for God to do different things in different people <laughs> and that everybody still had to do what I did, you know. They don't fully understand the grace of God. They don't fully understand uh, the variety of, of types of Christians, born again Christians. We're allowed to have freedom and liberty and it's no longer a black and white world. It's no longer follow the guidelines. Everybody looks identical. God has room for, for everybody to be mm -hmm. and to grow and to become a child of God. We're all on different levels. And the more I understood that, the more I relaxed, the more I was acceptable of somebody that, that wasn't maybe exactly on the level of where I was at in life. That's a difficult milestone for many of the former Amish. Yeah, to not have someone telling them how to live or them telling someone else how to live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people ask me, if I still consider myself Amish. Technically, I am not a baptized member of the Amish church. And so on that level, I say, no, I'm not Amish. But on another level, my family has been Amish for over 300 years. And so in a very real sense, I have an Amish heritage. But what exactly is it? And what am I going to pass on to my sons? Join me next time in the final episode as I explore my Amish heritage and exactly what it is that I will be passing on to my sons. <laughs>